Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us today to learn about what Congress needs to know about pending nuclear waste legislation. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change uh, policies. We do our best to focus on solutions and emphasize what can be done in response to a warming planet across the full range of mitigation and adaptation strategies. We also have developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in offering on-bill financing programs to their customers. One important educational tool in our toolbox are briefings, like the session today. We also publish a bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. And whether it's for policymakers or the public, our goal is always to provide informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in written materials and on social media. The best way to keep track of it all is to visit us online at www.eesi.org and sign up for Climate Change Solutions, the newsletter, and then follow us on Twitter at ESI Online. Today, we will look, take a fresh look at an issue, nuclear power plant decommissioning, that we first addressed about 18 months ago in May 2019. That briefing turned out to be one of the most popular of the year, and so we we're pleased when we discovered a new opportunity to hold a second briefing to call attention to the status of these issues. Nuclear power brings with it a lot of passion from people who hold a range of positions, pro and con. For me, I consider myself to be someone who needs to learn as much as possible about the topic because of what it means today, and especially how it will continue to be part of the US energy mix for some time, and what that means for our future. According to the 2020 Sustainable Energy Factbook, which was the topic of, a, topic of a briefing earlier this year held in partnership with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and Bloomberg New Energy Finance, nuclear power contributed a very constant 19 or 20% of US energy generation for each of the last 10 years. What is notable is not just the consistency year to year, it's also remarkably consistent compared to other sources. While renewable energy and natural gas resources became a bigger part of the mix over that time, and coal steadily declined in use. Nuclear power plants are big, complicated, and expensive. Once one gets built, which is no easy task, it is then with us for a very long time. Because of the rapidly changing economics of competing energy resources, the number of nuclear power plants is on track to become quite a lot lower. Over the next year, 20, uh, 10 years, excuse me, almost 200 nuclear power plants will close while only two are under construction. As that trend plays out, we will need to consider what energy resources, hopefully clean decarbonized energy resources, have to come online to meet our demand, which is likely to increase as electrification efforts intensify. And most critically, we will need to think very carefully about what to do with all of that waste. Nuclear waste disposal requires a permanent solution. It is too hazardous to move around. It, is, it will remain harmful to human health and the environment for thousands of years. And we should never lose sight of the impacts nuclear waste storage has on its surrounding communities, which may or may not have much say in decisions of what to put where and for how long. While we're in the early days of the lame duck session of the 116th Congress, there are still pressing issues and there are still proposals pending that would change how we de decommission nuclear power plants and responsibly manage nuclear waste uh, for the long term. And to help you better understand the status of these proposals, let us turn to our expert panelists. But before I turn to our first panelist, let me explain one last bit of logistics, and that is how to ask questions. We are not together in person today. So if you have a question or two, uh, you have two options to ask it. The first is you can send us a message on Twitter at EESI online or you can send an email to eesi at eesi.org. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions uh, during our Q&A after our third panelist presents. And that brings us to our first panelist. Robert Alvarez is an associate fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. He served as senior policy advisor to the Energy Department Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment from 1993 to 1999. During that tom, time, Bob led teams in North Korea to establish control of nuclear weapons materials. He also coordinated the Energy Department's nuclear material strategic planning and established its first asset management program. Before joining DOE, Bob served for five years as a senior investigator for the US Senate Committee on Government Affairs, then chaired by Senator John Glenn, and is one of the Senate's primary staff experts on US nuclear weapons program. 
1975, Bob helped found and direct the Environmental Policy Institute, a respected national public interest organization. Bob, welcome to the briefing today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. What I plan to do is to provide a baseline discussion about the probably the most significant aspect of decommissioning and actual operation of a nuclear power plant. Uh, nuclear power plants are not just about generating electricity. They've also become some of the most significant radioactive waste management operations in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. What are we talking about? Well, after 60 years, U U.S. reactors have generated the single largest inventory of spent nuclear fuel in the world, roughly about 20%. The spent fuel has been made of long rectangular assemblies containing tens of millions of fuel rods. The rods contain trillions of irradiated uranium pellets, the size of a fingertip. After bombardment with neutrons in the reactor core, about five to six percent of the pellets are converted to a myriad of uh, radioactive elements ranging from seconds to millions of years in terms of their half-lives. Standing next within a meter of a typical spent fuel nuclear assembly, which is, you, you certainly should not do and is definitely verboten, would guarantee a lethal radiation dose in minutes. Next slide, please. The U.S. Government Accountability Office informed the U.S. Congress, I mean, why should we be concerned about reactive spent fuel? It's because it's an ultra-hazardous material. The U.S. Accountability Office informed the U.S. Congress in April of 2017, they quote, spent nuclear fuel can pose serious risks to humans and the environment and is a source of billions of dollars in financial liabilities for the U.S. government. Look, according to the National Council of the National Academy of Sciences and others, if not handled and stored properly, this material can spread contamination, cause long-term health concerns, humans, and deaths. Because of these extraordinary hazards, uh, we have a federal law, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which was first enacted in 1982 and subsequently amended since then, particularly in 1987, that re requires this material to be disposed of in a geologic repository for uh, to prevent it from escaping in a human environment for up to a million years. To give you an idea of how radioactive we're talking about, these spent fuel contain some of the largest concentrations of artificial radioactivity in the globe. <clears throat> spent fuel currently contains roughly about 20 times more long-lived radioactive waste and generated by the nuclear weapons program over the last 50 years. Uh, anyway, I won't go, dwell on the numbers, but it, it gives you an idea of how great it is. The next slide, please. This is a comparison, again, to, under, to emphasize the importance of the hazard of spent nuclear fuel. Cesium-137 is a very important isotope because it, is, it makes up about roughly about 40% of the spent fuel uh, radioactive inventory. It is a particularly dangerous, it's very volatile, and when it escapes, it can cause lasting long-term contamination. Has a half life of about 30 years. Rule takes about as for considered not so harmful. And uh, and not only that, it gives off external penetrating radiation as it decays, and it mimics potassium in the environment. So it's taken up in all manner of, few, of organic material, particularly the human body, fruits, vegetables, grains, meats, etc. Uh, what this graph shows you just how much cesium-137 is contained in one spent fuel pool at the San Onofre site on the far right, compared to what was released by Chernobyl on the far left. Chernobyl released an estimated 1.89 million curies of cesium-137, which rendered an area roughly the size of half the size of New Jersey uninhabitable for the foreseeable future. <clears throat> 
So this there's a great deal of concern about Next slide. At the end of 2018, about 82,358 metric tons of spent nuclear fuel is currently stored at 119 sites. There are 95 nuclear power plant reactors in 29 states, which generate about 2,200 metric tons of spent fuel each year. There are 38 closed nuclear power reactors in the United States at 30 sites in various stages of decommissioning. About 48% of nuclear power spent fuel is stored in about 3,200 dry storage gas, of which 600 are at permanently closed sites. Uh, just to give you an idea of what's in pools and what's in uh, dry storage. This is just an idea of how much spent fuel is distributed in the United States. I'm not sure you can read this, but the state of Illinois has the largest amount of spent reactor fuel in the United States by virtue of having the largest single reactor fleet. Next slide, please. Heat from radioactive decay of spent fuel is also a principal safety concern. A few hours after a full reactor core is offloaded from the reactor, it can initially give off enough heat of, from radioactive decay to match the energy capacity of a steel mill furnace. This is hot enough to melt and ignite the fuel's reactive zirconium cladding. The zirconium is the cladding that surrounds the uranium. And if any of you are as old as I am, you remember the old fashioned light bulbs, flash bulbs. Well, the filament zirconium is a fact, and it can spontaneously catch fire once it or combust like a Roman sparker once it reaches a certain temperature. So it's hot enough to melt and ignite the fuel zirconium cladding. The cladding is roughly the thickness of a, of a credit card. And also, the heat is so great that when you start to put all this spent fuel in one place underground, it can actually, the heat itself can destabilize the geologic disposal medium. So you have to be careful. So you have to let this stuff cool off long before it can be put in the ground. And after you put it in the ground, it may require as long as 300 years of active ventilation. Uh, if water in a reactor spent fuel pool is drained by an earthquake or an act of malice, uh, you've, it can cause the most catastrophic fire. It can release enough radioactive material to contaminate an area twice radioactivity from an accident, if it were, for example, to Limerick Nuclear Power Plant near Philadelphia. Uh, it could force approximately 8 million people to relocate and result in $2 trillion in damages. Uh, my colleagues and I in 2003 formed a working group to put together a study for the first time that warned about the dangers of these pools draining. The pools are basically holding two to four times more than what their original designs intended. And that uh, they're not subject to the same kind of rigorous containment. They don't have redundant water supply. They don't have redundant Electric, electrical supplies, and they tend to be stored in buildings that are not hardened. So we were concerned at that time after 9-11, thought, well, what would happen if someone were to commit an act of malice? The, and so our initial study basically just reported that the, the, the consequences of a drainage would be quite severe. It created a great deal of controversy, and I, my colleagues and I were stricken from several Christmas card lists. <laughs> and uh, but the National Academy of Sciences was called in to sort of referee this dispute we were having with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They came out with a report in 2004, which the NRC unsuccessfully tried to suppress, which tended to agree with what we had to say. We, we believe that the danger to spent fuel pools could be greatly reduced by ending high-density storage and placing as much as possible in the dry casks. 
this is something that the industry is very much opposed to because it would mean extended downtimes. Next slide, please. Now, the other issue associated with storage and disposal is called high burnup. Over the last 15 or 20 years, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has permitted reactor operators to basically double the amount of time that the fuel can be irradiated in a reactor. And this is done by increasing the amount of uranium-235 from about, let's say, 2 3% to 4 or 5%. Uh, and so initially, reactors, operators, refuel their reactors every 12 months. Now they do it every two years. Uh, this fuel tends to contain a larger amount of uranium-235. However, there's a great deal of, of experimental data. The NRC didn't really under, took a leap of faith about how the safety of the spender outside of the reactor once it's used, and instead focus on whether it was safe to be used inside the reactor. What we subsequently learned is high burnup fuel reduces the cladding thickness. When you irradiate this fuel for twice as long as it does, it causes the, the pellets to swell, causes the uh, cladding to thin out, and also forms a, 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 a form of rust called hydrides, which can cause the zirconium cladding to fail and become brittle. The cladding is considered a primary barrier. It's very difficult to transport this stuff and you have to repackage it. And not only that, high burnup spent fuel generates much larger temperatures. Uh, recently, the Nuclear Waste Techn Techn Technical Review Board in the fall, in the fall of last that uh, there's some high burnup fuel out there that would have to sit at the reactor site into the next century to cool off unless we come up with a repackaging regime. Next slide, please. Now, what I'm getting into is something that Congress is mostly interested in, which is the money part. What is the extent of the government liability, for example? Well, one of the main sources of government liability is a failure to meet the opening date in the, in the 1987 amendments of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which was uh, the, the policy act stated that the U.S. government or the Department of Energy itself would be opening a repository on January 31st, 1998. They stipulated that a law because the Department of Energy was unable to do this largely for technical and political reasons. Uh, reactor operators have filed 40 laws and have been compensated for basically violation of contract. And right now, the, the total amount of settlements is about $8 billion. Department of Energy estimated that the total liability to the government for failure to meet the state is somewhere close to $36.5, $37 billion. Next slide, please. Now, what's important to understand here in terms of legislation that the Congress faces, and I'm not going to really discuss it in any legislation in any detail, but the fact is that under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, it says basically the U.S. government cannot accept title and therefore does not have financial responsibility other than missing the, the, the uh, startup date for a repository. This and that, that the uh, reactor operators were levied a user fee of no more than one mil per kilowatt hour, which generated approximately forty billion, forty one billion dollars now. But because of the cancellation of the Yucca Mountain project and the failure or the inability or refusal of Congress to restart the Yucca Mountain project, this the funds have stopped largely because of a lawsuit. The cost of consolidated storage, which is now before the Congress for a pilot program, would have to be borne by the reactor operators unless the government assumes title 
And so there's legislation proposing to do that, but I think you need to be aware that before Congress does this, you need to be aware that, that you might be putting down a, a down payment on a balloon mortgage. So now this, this slide here is just a graphic depiction of how much spent fuel is what are called stranded reactors, reactors that are uh, closed where they've generated the spent fuel or soon to be closed. And the orange component of the bar is high burnup fuel, which means that this, the spent fuel that's high burnup could stay at that site and be trapped there for many decades. Next slide, please. Repackaging is very important, and it's something that has not been dealt with very much. Uh, the, the, you cannot assume, and nor there is, is any strong uh, technical evidence to indicate that the current cast can be just sent to a repository as is. That are used for the economic convenience of the operator. None of them are licensed for disposal in a repository, and that's because of the decay heat, the amount of spent fuel that's there, the cumbersome nature of the uh, of the cast, and the fact that there's so many spent fuel rods in there that it poses potential criticality dangers. So, for example, Yucca Mountain, if Yucca Mountain were to be approved, uh, there would have to be extensive repackaging to deal with decay heat. Uh, existing large canisters place a burden, major burden on the geologic repository, which is handling and placement plus closure. Repackaging expenses rely on the transportability of the, trend of the canisters, more importantly, of the compatibility of the canister with heat loading requirements. Heat is a very, very in terms of geologic disposal, decay heat over thousands of years can cause waste to containers to corrode, negatively impact the geologic stability of a disposal site, and enhance the migration of the waste over the period of time that's been set by law. Peak temperatures in a repository can reach 212 degrees Fahrenheit and can extend beyond 300 years, depending on the geologic medium that's picked. So that means you may maybe be looking at the prospect of having 300 years of active ventilation, which is longer than when was at the time frame that this nation is existed. Next slide, please. Costs of repackaging are quite large. There are three types of, of uh, which the department has called standard transportation. Adopted one at the costs associated with one boiling water reactor at the in Washington State, the Columbia, Gen <clears throat> the Columbia Generating Station. It would involve opening 120 dry casts and repackaging about 1,860 spent fuel assemblies suitable for disposal. The additional costs would range from Two hundred seventy-two million to nine hundred fifteen million dollars. So, based on the, the Energy Department's strategic plan to open a repository by the year twenty-eight, the per assembly cost would be about per assembly would be about thirty-three thousand for a large stand down to uh, one hundred twelve thousand dollars for a small stand. The estimated cost of managing all of the waste from the assembly, which would be more than the cost to load the assembly in any of the canisters. Next slide, please. Uh, in October of 2017, I looked at a, uh, I looked at, a, I did a study looking at the cost to a single reactor for those costs that are not covered. Uh, right now, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, it has to be borne by the ratepayer or the reactor operator. And so, what I concluded is that for the Columbia Generating Station, the additional cost that would be borne 
for one reactor uh, for predisposal activities that are not covered under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. None of these funds can be used, for example. None of the funds collected to, to select a repository can be used. So the cost of interim storage would range from about 384 million to about $1.25 billion for a single reactor. These are the kinds of issues the Congress should be aware of and should be asking questions about before they make the plunge about assuming title at the reactor in order to uh, establish a consolidated centralized storage facility. Next slide, please. I think the basic approach undertaken right now needs to be fundamentally revamped to address the vulnerability of spent fuel storage in pools, high burn up spent fuel, and dry cash integrity risks. Instead, instead of waiting for problems to arise, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Energy Department need to develop a transparent and comprehensive roadmap. <coughs> So the unknowns associated with interim storage, transportation, repackaging, and final disposal of all nuclear fuel, including high burnout. Otherwise, it will be dependent on these that I consider to be leaps of faith relative to nuclear waste storage. Leaps that are setting a stage for a large, unfunded, radioactive balloon mortgage payment in the future. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, we uh, got off to a, a bit of a late start. We started a little bit past two o'clock. And so um, if we get close to three o'clock and um, we still have some questions that we need to get to, um, we're not going to um, prevent ourselves from spilling over another 15 minutes or so into the three o'clock hour. So um, fair warning. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to stick with us for uh, until about 3.15 or so. Um, but uh, we want to make sure that we have time to to, to follow up on the presentations and um, also allow our next two panelists plenty of time for them. Um, so uh, sorry for the last minute scheduling update, but I hope you understand and agree that it's a good idea. Um, our next panelist is Don Hancock. Don is director of the Nuclear Waste Program at Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, uh, where he has worked since 1975. He has been actively involved in the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIPP, or WIP, in New Mexico and nuclear waste issues nationwide, including uh, consulting with states, tribes, and citizen groups on repository and consolidated storage sites. He has testified before Congress and state legislative committees, and he's written many articles on the subject. Don, thank you for joining us today. I'll let you take it away. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everybody's attention today. Um, as you can see from my title slide, the focus of my presentation is on what I consider to be 33, more than 33 years of failure of legislation to meet the objective of having multiple operating repositories and at least one consolidated storage site. Next slide, please. So Bob has described the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. I want to highlight three principles. One is spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste are a national problem that, according to the law, require safe and environmentally acceptable methods of disposal. Second, the federal government is responsible for spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste disposal in geologic repositories. Third, the generators are responsible for interim storage and for paying for the disposal into the nuclear waste fund. The fourth principle that I'll also talk about relates to federal, state, and tribal relations. Next slide, please. So the law has very specific timeframes and activities uh, that were supposed to happen. As you can see, there are dates for the Department of Energy to nominate sites for the first repository, to select three sites for monitored retrievable storage, a government consolidated storage site. Um, the president was supposed to recommend the first site by March 31st of 1987, and following DOE nominating sites for a second repository uh, the president was supposed to uh, no, uh, recommend to Congress a second repository site three years later in 1990. 
And as Bob has already mentioned, the first repository was to be operating by January 31st of 1998. Next slide, please. The law also included these provisions related, numerous provisions related to notifying states and tribes, how they would participate in the process, funding for their participation, and the discussions about repository and MRS sites. Um, and after the presidential recommendation, states uh, or tribes, depending on where the facility was located, either repository or MRS, could submit a notice of disapproval. Um, those, that notice could, however, be overridden by a majority vote of each house in Congress. Next slide. So the reason for this discussion about federal interaction is because of the earlier history prior to the enactment of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, DOE's predecessor organization, designated, chose the first repository site uh, near Lyons, Kansas, which they said would be operating by 1975. However, because of technical problems with the site, the state of Kansas strongly opposed it, and that site was abandoned. Uh, thereafter, there were investigations uh, looking at sites in other places. No other state, uh, uh, other states objected. So by 1979, an interagency review group on nuclear waste management discussed various options about how states and tribes would participate and what their ultimate decision-making role could be. So one concept was a state veto. Another concept was consultation and concurrence. Um, but later that same year in 1979, Congress authorized the first geologic repository in the United States, which is not for spent fuel or high level waste. The waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico, which is for defense transuranic waste. And what the state of New Mexico was offered was consultation and cooperation. Next slide. So during the 80s, uh, the Department of Energy was um, proceeding with first and second round sites and MRS. There was a lot of opposition from citizens and states and tribes. So in 1987, Congress said, this isn't working. And so they stopped the characterization work at, in Hanford, Washington, Death Smith in Texas, and said Yucca Mountain would be the only repository to be considered. They also, in that amendments, uh, prohibited any further activity in the second repository sites, and any site-specific activity, which essentially ended the second round sites. And it, the law also annulled and revoked the DOE decision to do the MRS at, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. So what the law did say is that well, we'll offer benefits, financial and otherwise, to Nevada or if there would be an MRS site and establish the Office of Nuclear Waste Negotiator, which was to uh, go to states and tribes and try to see if they could find consenting states, states that were willing to negotiate some sort of agreement to host, other than Nevada, to host a repository in another state or an MRS site. Uh, any such agreements, had they been uh, achieved, would have required a, uh, approval by an act of Congress. Next slide. So there were two people who were selected, uh, nominated by the president, confirmed by the Senate to be nuclear waste negotiators. They engaged in a pretty aggressive process over five years to try to find uh, state or tribe willing to volunteer for a repository or an MRS site. They couldn't find anybody. There were grants. The negotiator did issue grants to a number of tribes and some counties to study who had agreed to study the possibility of a MRS type facility. Next slide. So that led to what we're now calling more recently a private consolidated storage site. One result of the negotiator process is that some leaders of the Skull Valley Band of Goshute in Utah and numerous utilities got together to say, 
we would do a private consolidated storage site in Utah. Uh, they went through the licensing process in 2006. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission licensed that site despite strong citizen, state objection, and even congressional uh, objections. Later that year, so the license was issued, but later that year, um, the BLM refused a right of way to allow transport into the site. The Bureau of Indian Affairs refused to approve uh, the lease between the tribe and the utilities. So private fuel storage is licensed, but it was never constructed or operated. Later on, over the last four years, two other private companies, um, Holtec in New Mexico and Integrated Storage Partners uh, with the Waste Control Specialist site in West Texas, have proposed consolidated storage sites, which are currently in an NRC licensing process. Again, there's very strong uh, opposition by the overwhelming majority of people who've been commenting on those proposals, as well as opposition from state officials, notably including the governors of New Mexico and Texas. Next slide. So while Congress has not changed the authorization of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, of course, each year Congress does appropriate money. And for the 27 years after the enactment of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, Congress appropriated about $13 billion for work under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and for Yucca Mountain. However, no funding has been provided for Yucca Mountain since 2010. Uh, instead, during that time, usually, generally, up until last year, the House Energy and Water Appropriations has included some funding for Yucca Mountain to try to continue Yucca Mountain. But the Senate bill has not included any funding for Yucca Mountain. Instead, the Senate has proposed since 2013 each year um, essentially amending the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to allow funding for DOE to fund a pilot cons private consolidated storage site. Next slide. So that means where we are is that since Congress hasn't funded Yucca Mountain and hasn't funded consolidated storage, that was also, that was still the case in 2020, last year, no funding. And so that's today as we speak also the situation because the continuing resolution that was passed in September that runs through December 11th still has no funding. Uh, for this fiscal year we're in, 2021, the House bill, again, no funding for Yucca Mountain, no funding for private consolidated storage. It does include $27.5 million. $20 million of it is intended to start a federal interim storage consent-based process, sort of an MRS kind of process. The Senate bill that was released on Tuesday of this week again, has no funding for Yucca Mountain. It also has $27.5 million, but for different purposes. It, again, has a Section 306, which would change the Nuclear Waste Policy Act to so that up to $10 million could be provided for private consolidated storage, and then another $17.5 million for other storage activities. Next slide. So based on that history, I want to uh, raise five conclusions. Uh, the first one is that pretty clearly administrations, Congresses, and the nuclear industry failed to implement the 1982 law. And since 1987, Congress has not adopted new legislation authorizing uh, anything else. Thirdly, what happened, has happened with commercial spent fuel, and Bob has talked about this, in 1987, there was about 16,000 metric tons stored. Now it's 85,000 or more stored at uh, operating and decommissioned sites. Fourthly, it seems clear that no state or tribe will consent to host the only repository or consolidated storage site. And fifth, importantly, in my view, legislation for publicly accepted, technically sound, waste storage and disposal have not been introduced. Last slide. This is my contact information. and I'll be pleased to answer questions after Diane now talks about uh, proposals for changing authorization. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, and uh, thanks for the um, thanks for the great presentation. Um, our third panelist uh, 
Don just mentioned her first name, Diane. Uh, Diane Darago is the Radioactive Waste Project Director uh, at Nuclear Information and Resource Service. She has degrees in chemistry and environmental studies, and her work history includes analytical and organic chemistry with a focus on the pollutants in the Great Lakes. She has also worked as a community organizer, a researcher at public interest in environmental groups. She has closely tracked nuclear waste issues for decades, including high-level and so-called low-level, which I don't think really exists, uh, commercial and weapons waste. She has repeatedly challenged state, national, and international moves to deregulate nuclear waste that would allow it to be made into everyday household items and dumped as regular trash. Diane, thanks very much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Thank you. Uh, I'm Diane DeRigo, Nuclear Information Resource Service. And uh, I think the point has been made in uh, the previous presentations, especially Bob's, that the irradiated fuel, and we call it irradiated, it's also referred to as spent, is actually very, very hot. Uh, these are pie charts from the Department of Energy, and that bottom one is radioactivity. The whole pie is all the radioactivity in the nuclear power and weapons fuel chain. The black is the commercial irradiated nuclear fuel. So over 90 or 95 percent of the radioactivity from nuclear power and weapons is in the irradiated fuel or spent fuel that is now targeted to move on roads, rails, and waterways if legislation passes to move it to a permanent or supposedly interim site. And it also means that it needs to be uh, taken, we need to take better care of it where it is at, at uh, the reactor sites. Uh, just a brief background here is that yucca won't work uh, for technical, uh, moral, political, economic, uh, legal, environmental justice uh, reasons. Uh, yucca Mountain is a non-starter. And I don't have a lot of time to go into that, but it's a violation of the Ruby Valley Treaty of 1863 with the Western Shoshone. Uh, if we were to go back into licensing as uh, one or more of the bills before us in Congress would direct, uh, we're throwing good money after bad. Uh, they're saying a billion, a hundred billion to complete the uh, processing and opening, uh, the licensing and opening of the site, and then two to three billion per year uh, to make it happen. So. Yucca is, uh, it was canceled in 2010 and it should stay canceled and we should move on. Uh, the next idea uh, that had came out of the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission but has been around in the past is supposedly uh, interim storage. Um, it's referred to in the existing federal legislation as MRS or Monitored Retrievable Storage. Before that it was called AFR, Away from Reactor Storage, and it needs to be um, uh, well, what it would be is a place to bring the waste supposedly interimly, and the current law requires that uh, waste can't go to a supposedly interim site unless a permanent site is operating. Uh, and the title to the waste doesn't transfer from the private owners to the uh, federal government and the Department of Energy and yours and my taxes until a it goes to a permanent site. So what the um, consolidated storage does uh, what some of the bills do is to allow the title to transfer uh, before it goes to a permanent site. Um, Bob mentioned how dangerous the waste is. Uh, it would mean a lot of transportation. Um, each container has more cesium in it than was released by the Chernobyl accident. And I just have a chart here that shows, a map here that shows where the cesium spread in the Chernobyl accident. Bob gave you numbers about amounts. I'm showing you what uh, the accident um, led to devastation, and some of these areas are permanently um, evacuated. So uh, the point is that the canisters that would be used, that are used to store, and that are being uh, proposed to move the waste, um, really do need to have better integrity than they do right now. Um, Some of the risks of consolidated storage include slowing the progress toward finding permanent isolation, uh, spreading the, the uh, radioactivity across the country uh, to uh, on the roads and rails uh, through our communities, through most of the congress congressional districts, 300 of the 435, and, um, and, and it brings us no closer to a permanent solution for it. Uh, this uh, the 
canisters are both thermally and radioactively hot. This is a uh, infrared, so we're looking at the heat in an irradiated fuel uh, train cask as it's moving, uh, so it's not the radioactivity, but the casks do give up radioactivity. If they had enough shielding to block all the radioactive emissions, they'd be way too heavy to move. So there's a compromise there, and uh, the waste is moved in containers that have a legal level of uh, emission or, or radioactivity coming off uh, as surface shine. And moving the waste, uh, was projected would take about 40 or 50 years to take 70,000 metric tons out to Yucca Mountain. Uh, some of the bills, one of the bills would raise the allowable amount for Yucca Mountain if it were to be uh, resumed uh, to 110,000. Um, and the amounts for the Texas and New Mexico proposed sites that were mentioned previously um, are uh, 40,000 and a hundred and uh, over 173,000 metric tons. So we would have waste moving mostly from reactors in the eastern part of the state of the country uh, to proposed sites out in the west. Um, as I said, the Texas site uh, is uh, planning a full operation to take 40,000 metric tons of irradiated nuclear fuel and the uh, Holtec site in New Mexico um, over 173,000. So together, that's more than three times the amount of waste that was targeted at Yucca, that Yucca's maximum limit is. Uh, and so that means we'd have, if these were fulfilled, three times more waste moving. It either means it's going to take more than the decades that were previously expected, or we're going to have more per day or per week than uh, would go there. We're taught, and as we continue to make more waste, we're making um, we're guaranteeing more shipments, either one time to a permanent site or uh, twice, once to an interim and then to a permanent. Uh, the transport routes uh, pretty much would be all the major train uh, tracks. The, the plan is at this point to move it by rail because you can uh, take heavier uh, loads by rail, but uh, there would have to be barging and uh, heavy load trucks to uh, get it to the railheads. And we're talking about barging in the Great Lakes and in um, uh, oceans, rivers, wherever the reactors are that don't have access to rail lines. The um, Yucca Mountain proposal, uh, the Department of Energy and the state of Nevada put together maps of proposed potential routes. And as I said, this, uh, uh, th this included both uh, roads and rails, and we're talking in the teens of thousands. So uh, for 70,000 metric tons, maybe um, in the range of 15,000 shipments. And again, it's through uh, more than 75% of the congressional districts, and each of them with that amount of radioactivity we previously described. Accidents are going to happen. Accidents do happen. Uh, there have been many accidents that have happened that are much more severe than the criteria on which the canisters are based. So the canisters are certified by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they have to meet certain criteria, and these are in the federal regulations at 10 CFR, Code of Federal, Regula federal Regulations 71, and some of those uh, criteria that the, the tra transport casks have to meet are uh, below the level of severity that they will encounter in uh, either routine shipments or especially in accident scenarios. Um, so I, this isn't a talk on the transport dangers, but that's a very important issue to not be dismissed as you're looking at this legislation. Uh, and then the Texas Council on Environmental Quality did a report, and one of the things they pointed out is that uh, terrorism or um, uh, you know, sabotage, deliberate attacks on these shipments are a possibility. And uh, what we're talking about now is taking this massive amount of waste that's at each site uh, sitting there in storage and needing better storage at the reactor, by the way, um, uh, and putting it on the roads and rails. So the containers aren't really good enough for where they are now, and now we're talking about moving them at 60 miles an hour across the country or uh, faster on trains uh, to sites that are supposedly interim. We're adding one more sacrifice area to uh, those that we already have. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so at reactors, um, well, uh, okay, so 
containers for transport, uh, as I said, are not designed though. There's been a push for better storage of the waste at those sites. Um, and Bob mentioned the need for recontainerizing the waste before it goes to a permanent repository. And the only way to do that is through uh, remote control. So pools or dry storage, uh, dry uh, transfer facilities will be needed. And pools are being uh, dismantled and there are no dry transfer facilities. So in addition to uh, planning for better uh, storage at uh, reactors where it's stored now, we've also got to think about how it's going to be recontainerized and, uh, and monitored for uh, cracks and leaks and other um, potential problems, especially as the canisters age. Um, hardened on-site storage is a concept that has been adopted by organizations across the country in all 50 states to have better uh, secure storage of the waste at the, at the reactors where it is now. And there's a development of uh, concepts for the minimum requirements for storage uh, requiring, um, for example, venting, uh, the canisters are designed to vent and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, has decided we don't have to uh, monitor for the radioactivity coming off of the canisters. Uh, the NRC is generally reducing the amount of a regulatory oversight once a reactor closes, yet we've got the whole inventory of all the waste that's been generated throughout the time of the reactor operation uh, sitting there and absolutely needing control. Another extremely important aspect of all this is environmental justice. All three of the proposed sites right now, the Yucca Mountain site is on Western Shoshone sacred lands, uh, violating the Ruby Valley Treaty of 1863 in order to proceed with it. Uh, the two sites in Texas and New Mexico are in communities that are largely Latinx. And uh, as Don mentioned, there's opposition at all of these sites and that needs to be respected. We've got to stop the uh, business as usual of sending the worst uh, radioactive hazardous and other dangerous facilities to communities of color. It's just, it, it's time to move on. If, if that hasn't been made clear in the last year or two, uh, I don't know when it's going to be. So there are bills in Congress um, that deal with uh, uh, the nuclear waste issue. Um, HR 2699 and S2917 is a uh, the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act of 2019, it would legalize, so uh, I mentioned earlier, it's been mentioned MRS, Monitored Retrievable Storage. Uh, the, the title doesn't transfer until it goes to a permanent site. So if we've got an interim, either MRS or CIS site, um, what these laws would do is to enable the title transfer to take place before it goes to a permanent site. So we as the taxpayers then become responsible for it uh, sooner. And uh, so what uh, all three of these bills, um, HR 2699 and uh, S1234 in the Senate and HR 3136 would do is to allow that title transfer to take place uh, before a permanent repository. Um, the bill, uh, let's see, S1234 would uh, set up a new administration to uh, site repository and uh, an interim site, and it would require consent, uh, but not for facilities that are already in the licensing process. Uh, it's uh, okay as the Department of Energy to change the standard contracts to take title and liability, and um, it restarts the light, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's for a one, two, three, four. Um, jumping back to 2699 and 2917, those would restart the Yucca Mountain licensing process, which, um, as I said, is throwing good money after bad. There are over 200 contentions against the licensing by the state of Nevada and uh, the uh, Western Shoshone uh, community organization. The um, S3136 focuses specifically on consolidated interim storage, making it legal and uh, in, uh, directing the Department of Energy to enter into a development of either a federal or non-federal consolidated interim storage. The last bill I've listed here has just come up. Um, it is um, 
you can't see my slide, 8258, it would not only encourage consolidated interim storage, but also reprocessing, which makes the waste problem even worse, it chops it up, dissolves it, and spreads it around, and um, is a major proliferation, uh, weapons proliferation risk. And it would also uh, push for advanced new reactors, which means more waste. The bills that, um, I'm going to summarize those, the bills that are um, likely to come up in lame duck, uh, Don mentioned the appropriations. Um, there's a Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, which is not specifically on waste, but it would um, lead to making more waste because it would subsidize new nuclear reactors. And one of the things it does is to allow federal agencies to pay higher than market value for the electricity so we could have our federal tax dollars be subsidizing nuclear power over uh, more competitive uh, renewables. So this act um, would make more waste. And it is something that we have heard could be moving in the um, by attaching to the uh, National Defense um, Act, Authorization Act, which is a must pass. And then um, we have a couple of bills that I wanted to mention that are important. Um, the Stranded Act, that's the one at the bottom here, uh, there's a version of it in both the House and the Senate. It would provide funding to communities that are basically have closed reactors and still have the waste for indefinite amount of time. And so it would, uh, sub, it would provide them with some amount of um, compensation for, for that. Um, the compensation is incorporated into the Nuclear Plant Decommissioning Act of 2020, which um, is good because it makes an effort to enable the state and the local communities, the tribes, to have greater involvement in the decommissioning process. At this point, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission pretty much ramrods whatever it wants. It's between them and the utility, and it's really hard for local people to have any input. So this would uh, set up a process for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to consider some of the concerns and interests of the uh, community in which it's located. And the um, Nuclear Waste Con uh, Informed Consent Acts are ones that would require consent before nuclear sites could be put in place. I wanted to mention the uh, Radiation Exposure Compensation Act and the importance of having that be voted on in the Senate and the House Judiciary Committees this December so that it can be voted on and that the compensation to people downwind from the government uh, nuclear projects, uh, bomb testing and um, uranium workers who uh, worked within the uranium industry after 1971 are not being compensated for their services and their health effects from uh, government actions with radioactivity. This would extend the existing act until uh, the 2040s and it would uh, expand it to cover more people that were not covered in the original act. So the, the push there by uh, the advocates of that bill is for the Senate and the House Judiciary Committees to, um, to vote on those. They've been bottled up in committee for years and the whole act is going to expire if they don't proceed. Uh, so let's see, I have one more thing. I was asked to alert people to the very large lies about supposedly very low level radioactive waste. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the, the nuclear industry, other federal agencies, DOE, EPA, have all been pushing over the decades to allow some of the nuclear waste from uh, nuclear power and weapons to be deregulated and allowed to go into regular garbage, recycling, hazardous sites, incinerators, places that are not licensed for nuclear activities. And this is about the 14th or 15th time that it's come up, and the acronyms have changed over the years from de minimis to below regulatory concern, and now they're calling it very low level waste, even though the amount of waste that could be deregulated and sent to uh, landfills that are not licensed for nuclear um, is pretty much 
all the waste except the irradiated fuel that the rest of this discussion has been on. Uh, it would enable the department, I'm sorry, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would, at the request of a, a solid waste facility, a hazardous facility, give them exempt, specific exempt authority to take nuclear waste. And that site, according to the proposal right now, would be able to emit as much radioactivity, it's not licensed, but it could give up as much radioactivity as an operating nuclear reactor or a, an operating uh, radioactive waste disposal site. So that is um, what's before us. Um, I'm hoping Congress will step in to stop that if it isn't stopped on its own. And I look forward to questions and uh, discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane. Um, I, one word comes to mind uh, after listening to the three of your presentations, and that word is yikes. Uh, this is a big problem, and we have to do something about it. And um, seems like Congress might be the group of people um, that, that could make the most difference if they, um, if they could only. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to go about 15 minutes extra, so apologies to um, uh, those in our audience who, um, you know, maybe have a conflict, but just as a reminder, this full briefing, the archive, all of the materials, and a slew of additional materials from our panelists will be available pretty soon after we conclude today. Um, you can find that all at www.esi.org. So if you miss anything or if you want to go back and listen to something again, uh, just as a reminder, everything is available. We've been doing very well with questions by email and by Twitter, so thanks to everyone in our audience for that. Um, if you would like to try to get one in uh, before we conclude today, um, the best way to do it is to follow us on Twitter at EESI Online or send us an email, WW, or, excuse me, EESI at EESI.org. I almost gave the website for the email address, but they're different things. So we have some questions, and uh, I'm going to start with two uh, that I thought were really interesting because they help. I think they'll help us understand a little bit about sort of the risk of inaction uh, beyond what your presentation's already covered. Um, the first asks about what are the radiological consequences of a loss of integrity of a spent fuel cask or canister? And um, based on your presentation, Diane, I'll add a second part of that question. How does it vary based on whether, uh, based on where it's stored or how long it's been stored or how it's transported? And Bob, we'll go back to you and give you the first opportunity to answer, and then we'll move through Don and Diane after that. Well, I, I think the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has not done a serious quantitative study of what would happen of a major cast failure. They have provided some information to emergency responders for modeling purposes in terms of emergency response. Uh, and they modeled a, an accident, not an accident, but an act of malice involving someone placing a shape charge on a uh, island soda. Uh, a substantial amount of cesium would be released. Uh, but no, but it would not be as much as a spent fuel pool fire, but it would be substantial, about 34,000 curies. So, um, you know, the point that, that I think we need to understand is that other nations, particularly Germany and Switzerland, have done, have been much more careful and cautious about storage. Uh, we've, they experienced a lot of NATO jet crashes during, during the 80s and decided they had enough of this. So what the Germans and Swiss have done, they heavied up their switch yards, they added another foot of containment in their reactor domes, and they placed their spent fuel into hard, dry, hardened storage facility. They did have spent fuel was spermed or placed into buildings they were able to stand large Great, thanks. Um, Don and Diane, um, do you have anything else you'd like to add to sort of what the consequences of this might be and how it might vary based on where the material is stored or transported? Well, I guess two things just really quickly. One, if there was any serious accident, it would be uh, a major national and international concern and um, be the, the, the problems are not only the kinds of things that Bob showed with his slide of limerick and has talked about, but the 
psychological, the trauma consequences that that would have on people nearby and otherwise. And the second point is uh, the transportation issue, which uh, Diane also mentioned. Um, uh, uh, again, an accident there in transportation would be in an uncontained situation as opposed to at a power plant where in theory there are people who are used to, uh, or in fact are people who are used to trying to deal with the fuel, whereas uh, transportation could be either in a big city or a rural area. Uh, so the consequences again could be serious in terms of contamination and the long-term effects um, uh, could be bad both health and environment, but also psychological. And uh, the depending on how much damage is done, the containers are um, are big and they're heavy and uh, robust, but they are not designed to withstand a fire longer than a half an hour or above 1475. And there was an analysis done by Radioactive Waste Management Associates of if the uh, radioactive cask were in the Baltimore Tunnel fire, and I believe it was in the range of 100 people would, would die, uh, not maybe immediately, but with the radioactivity that spread around and the amounts of uh, damage, uh, cost of damage would depend on where it's spread. Uh, you also have some canisters that only have four or six fuel assemblies, and then there's others that have as many as 37. So how much of the radioactivity uh, is in the container and how much gets out before there's some kind of stoppage of it? Uh, if it were to fall into a body of water, uh, there have been, um, th there are criteria for um, designs that it should only be in water for uh, an hour or maybe 65 hours, but the containers are extremely heavy, and so would the facilities be able to get there, locate, and pull it out in time? Uh, so in the slide I had quoted from a uh, study for the Nevada Nuclear Waste Project Office that uh, cleanup costs could exceed $620 million in a rural area, and in an urban area, it could cost up to $9.5 billion to raise and rebuild the most heavily contaminated square mile. Now, considering that there's no safe dose of radioactivity, if you're spreading out radioactivity that is as enormous as we've got, we're not even going to know all the cancers that um, they're, they're still fighting over how many cancers are resulting from the Chernobyl accident. So um, there would be potentially uh, immediate um, problems for emergency responders or people in the vicinity. Uh, and it, it could be that available on seats and maybe uh, just some gets out, or it could be that there's there are different scenarios for how the um, radioactivity could get out. But the consequences could be very severe, and it may not be a very um, high risk. But the more shipments we've got, the higher the risk. And we're talking now in the thousands, in thousands, in thousands of shipments over 30, 40, 50 years, just to a temporary site, and then again to a permanent. So we're we're setting ourselves up for some disasters. Well, uh, thank you for that. Um, that was really helpful. Um, another, this one is going to be more of a grab bag. So if you have an answer to it, well, we don't necessarily have to go through the whole um, panel, but if you have anything, we'd, we'd love to have your um, thoughts on it. Uh, this one is um, allows for a little bit of imagination and some estimation. And the question is, if the bills discussed enable the Department of Energy to take title to the waste so it can be shipped to consolidated interim storage facilities, do any of you have an estimate, um, even if it's just within an order of magnitude, what the potential liability or exposure would be for the federal government? Sure. Uh, depending on the size of the, of the uh, storage site, the he has done some stuff involving the very same people that are seeking a license to establish such a facility. And the high end of the cost is about $23 billion. The low end is probably on the order of uh, $7 billion. Okay. Um, Don or Diane, do you have any other thoughts about putting that in, um, putting that in context? I, I, I think those those are, are, are good estimates that we have uh, right now. Uh, again, 
it depends on whether everything works perfectly or not. In the case of the three sites that have been considered private fuel storage that I talked about, and the Texas and New Mexico sites, um, there will be major conflicts um, if the proposal is to go forward with uh, uh, states and, and potentially also people along the transportation route. So that could have significant liability questions as well as as well as uh, delaying things, et cetera. Um, I uh, would uh, oh, go ahead, Bob. One thing that I, I, it's not clear to me about the, this legislation is that these reactors, as a whole, generate about two thousand two hundred metric tons of spent fuel a year. So when you assume title at the reactor. Does that mean the federal government's going to be responsible for building all the dry casts and managing the waste as it comes out of the reactor, in addition to making sure it can be safely transported to a, a site the government will have to pay for? And I don't know whether that's that distinction has been drawn at all. Well, that was actually what I was uh, I was going to mention that there are three big pots of money here uh, that the the uh, private companies that are building consolidated storage want to go after. They want to go after decommissioning funds to the extent that they can. They want to go after the damages that have been uh, given to the private owners of the fuel because of the, the legal decision that there was no 1998 repository. Uh, so they want to get access to that, to those funds. And then um, the nuclear waste fund, which was designed primarily for permanent disposal, they want to get at that. So we have um, things that need to be done with these way, with uh, the nuclear reactors themselves are all waste, they need decommissioning. Uh, the, the, the permanent repository is something that needs to be sought. And if uh, the money ends up being waylaid for consolidated storage, then it could take away from the other important activities that, are, that the money has been uh, set aside for. Uh, Don, did you have something? Yeah, and just one other point. When you talk about liability, the assumption on consolidated storage is it would be temporary. Since there is no repository, the liability would last a lot longer because everybody agrees, including Congress, going back to 1982, that the permanent disposal is not leaving it on the surface someplace um, where clearly you would have problems. So that would that would, again, the federal government would have title with the waste at the reactor or taking it to a consolidated site, which won't work long term. So again, what the ultimate cost would be of that have really not been calculated, but would be enormous. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is going to be the last one. And again, uh, we're going to treat it uh, a little bit of a, as a grab bag. And it's a sort of a mix of a bunch of different questions. And Diane, it builds on something that you covered in your presentation, which was sort of the en environmental justice um, uh, considerations that this issue, um, you know, brings up constantly and sort of specifically how um, communities are impacted. So um, as far as last words, um, do any of you have any thoughts about uh, if any of the legislation that you've all described today have the kinds of environmental justice provisions that you would like to see, or if there, if this is a need for Congress to pay, you know, extra attention to. And then second, um, as far as communities go, um, are there any fair ways for communities to be compensated to the extent that they're hosting either sort of because it's there already or because they may choose to host um, nuclear waste? And I'll s send that out to the group and if anyone has any thoughts. Well, uh, go ahead, Don. So, so a couple of things. Uh, one is, as Diane mentioned in the cons, um, in talking at the end about the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, um, uh, there have been environmental justice issues uh, historically in terms of who's contaminated and who's not compensated. So that certainly needs to be uh, uh, addressed. Uh, in terms of what needs to be done, um, as I said, my last conclusion was there hasn't even been introduced a comprehensive storage disposal bill that deals with all of these issues, the liability questions, the, the participation questions, the 
um, environmental justice questions, et cetera. So this is, this is gonna be a very complicated problem. We've had 33 years of not doing it. It's gonna take a while to get good legislation and to get it passed and to then implement it. Um, I guess the other point I wanna make is the original Nuclear Waste Policy Act was clear that there needed to be multiple repositories. One of the ways that would need to happen, I think, is to have multiple repositories so it's not being put on any one state, any one tribe, any, so there would, there hopefully would not be those kinds of environmental justice issues of we're picking a site and choosing somebody as for example was done in 1987 with Yucca Mountain and as Diane said, Western Shoshone land. Bob, were you gonna say something? I think that, yeah, I think that if everything went swimmingly well in terms of the development of a consolidated interim storage site, I think that the bare truth, the, the, the raw truth is that a great deal of these spent fields are gonna be trapped at these sites in a definite period of time after the reactor shut down. And when the reactor shuts down, the communities lose their tax base. They lose their funding for their schools, for their police, for their fire. And there has to be some way to deal with that. We dealt with it in terms of the closure of the nuclear weapons sites in the late 1980s, but these were sites owned by the government, so it was relatively straightforward. But there, there needs to be somebody to some way to address this fact. Uh, Don also mentioned there's multiple sites. The original premise of the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 was based on the concept of regional equity. Senator Congressman Udall, in particular, was very instrumental in making sure there'd be multiple repositories. Why should one state, which does not have any draw any benefits from nuclear power? In terms of generation become the end of a radioactive waste funnel because they're in a remote location out west and that's, that's what the original law set forth is that however when the event is in the map east of the united states it's provoked such a political outrage right a year before the 1988 elections that in the dead of night congress in its wisdom picked yucca mountain and took everything off the table Uh, so, with regard to um, some compensation, I'm not saying it's enough, but it's a, a beginning. The Stranded Act, which is uh, S1985 and HR 5608, uh, is designed to provide some compensation for communities with closed reactors. And uh, HR 8277, and I don't know the Senate bill number if it has one yet for the Nuclear Plant Decommissioning Act of 2020, those would, uh, that takes in the Stranded Act uh, compensation and also adds to uh, the, the decommissioning process more influence from or input from the local community. Um, I'm not saying that's the answer, but that's, that's a beginning of, of looking at something that really does need to happen. With regard to, is there an amount that um, is payable? I think that's part of what the nuclear waste negotiator that Don was uh, talking about. I think it was you, Don, that talked about the nuclear waste negotiator trying to find a state or a tribe that would volunteer to take the waste. And they were offering increasing amounts of money uh, for getting more and more involved and committed to it. And in the end, uh, nobody wanted to, to bite the apple completely. Um, there's a moral dilemma with uh, obviously poorer communities are more desperate for uh, projects to happen. Uh, and so they might feel that they have to, to take some amount of money. Um, however, there's also uh, the, the impact that this is gonna have on existing vibrant communities. Uh, there are, uh, cattle farmers and pecan growers and oil and gas companies in the Texas, New Mexico area that have a, a, a growing economy and they don't want to have this uh, brought in on it. Um, however, uh, a lot of the people in those communities are poorer and in, in uh, Nevada as well, but regardless, they've said no. So what does it take to 
get a community to say yes. Um, one of the things that's been proposed is that instead of Congress being so heavy handed and superseding state and local laws and regulations that they actually take away the exemptions from uh, nuclear, they're exempted from a lot of the other environmental laws. Uh, and if we take those away and allow states to have greater regulatory authority and make the facility meet the existing, sometimes even inadequate, but better than we've got going, environmental protections, that there might be more um, openness to having such a facility or facilities. And I would also, I didn't mention it, I don't think in my talk about the environmental justice impacts, but most of the, a lot of the transport routes go through poor communities. And so you're not only having the destination be poor communities, but also the routes going there. Um, the waste needs to be moved once to a permanent uh, isolation and not um, routinely back and forth to the least common denominator. Great. Well, thanks. That's a, a good place to end. Uh, and um, sorry that we went a little long, but I think it was worth sticking it out a little bit to get to um, uh, answers to some of those questions. And I'm especially glad that we had time to, to sort of talk through some of those environmental justice considerations. Um, we're going to end there. Thanks to everyone who uh, joined us today. Um, we had a great discussion. And as a reminder, if you missed anything or if you want to go back and review slides or information or um, we also have a bunch of other resources that our panelists have provided. Uh, the best way to do that is to visit us uh, online at www.eesi.org. Um, if you have a moment, we'd really appreciate your help. Uh, we have a survey. There's a link on the screen right now. If you have two minutes or less to, to log in and share with us what you thought, um, suggestions, um, ideas, uh, we're always looking for feedback and we're always doing our best to incorporate that feedback into the next set of briefings. Speaking of next set of briefings, uh, we have a three-part mini-series next week on transportation issues. We're going to be looking at uh, aviation, uh, transit, and ports uh, from the perspective of uh, climate change and um, what those sectors are contributing to emissions reductions and what the potential is. So hopefully, you'll have a chance to join us. Um, uh, one last plug for Climate Change Solutions. It's our bi-weekly newsletter, the best way to stay in touch uh, and up to date with everything that we're doing. And I can never uh, stop without thanking all the people behind the scenes who help make this work. So thanks to Troy and Curtis who helped us with the technology. Thanks to our friend Steve uh, who helped pull the briefing together. And thanks to Omri and Dano, my colleagues here at EESI who uh, were busy behind the scenes pulling it off. Um, we'll go ahead and end there. I hope everyone has a great weekend and um, take care and hope to see you next week for our three-part transportation series. Have a great afternoon, have a great weekend.